goodness. I have to tell you, Gemma, I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning like a little kid. Happened to look out the window, and there it was. And it was transformative. I wasn't affected by the one a week ago. This somehow had all the magic in the world for me. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, and it brought back the memories of nose to the window, uh -huh. looking out, and then <gasps> Robert Frost, dust of snow. Robert Frost has such a wonderful process. Take in nature, let it go deep, and then come out with a poem. The dust of snow from a hemlock tree has changed my heart and saved some part of a day I had rude. I think I forgot a line. Um, the way a crow shook down on me the dust of snow from a hemlock tree has given my heart a change of mood and saved some part of a day I had rude. Depressed, walking in the woods, almost a loss of a day emotionally, and then that little crow on the hemlock tree goes, dust, dust, down comes the snow on Robert Frost's head, and he says, oh, that was cute. I feel different, the dust of snow. And it's just a short little upbeat poem and says so much. It does. It's that, that element of the unexpected that, that brings you uh, a new realization. And a new joy, mm -hmm. which he had given up on, which I had rude. In other words, let go. Um, nature and Christmas, for me, go together. My theme today f is uh, that there, gratitude. Gratitude for Nature's Inspiration. So welcome to Poetry of Immigrants. We're here to celebrate really poetic voices from all around the world. We've been doing that for a year. And thank you for helping. Thank you for inviting me it's to be part of this beautiful process. Wonderfully. And um, we will start again next February. And go from Mexico and do the whole thing over again. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to celebrate nature in December with a couple of poems, children's poems, which captures the magic, I think, of being wonderstruck by the beauty of nature in Christmas time. It comes from a children's book, Guilford Library. All the Wild Wonders, Poems of the Earth. A gentleman from Turkey, a poet from Turkey. Evening, translated by Menengakalu. In the words full of evening, the nightingales are silent. The rivers absorb the sky and its fountains. Birds return to the indigo shores from the shadows, a scarlet pearl of sunshine in their beaks. Gray and white and black, little lament here. They've changed our living spaces to gray and white and black. What used to be our wetlands are concrete and tarmac. Where once a stretch of water, a motorway, or worse, a man-made hardcore desert, an antiseptic curse. Where once a thriving reed bed, a place to rest and feed when winter time was over. A place to stretch and breed is now a dry, hard grayness. No vestige of a lake. It won't come back. No more tarmac for everybody's sake. <coughs> I love this poet, Sergei Asenin, a uh, revolutionary poet uh, in the 30s, um, ran afoul of Stalin, as all did in the 30s. Night, 
Silently sleeps the river, the dark pines hold their peace. The nightingale does not sing, or the corncrake screech. Night, silence enfolds, only the brook murmurs, and the brilliant moon turns everything to silver, silver the river and the rivulets, silver the grass of the fertile steppes. Night, silence enfolds, all sleeps in nature, and the brilliant moon turns everything to silver. Translated by G. Thurley. That's lovely. Can I read one that I was going to read later, but since Ooh. you're on to this nature and how we interact with it. And Especially as children. As children, right. Through perspective. So, and this is, this is very much a, ch a child's point of view. It's about a, a little Christmas tree. And when I was little, um, we didn't cut down Christmas trees. My father would get a bald tree mm -hmm. and put it inside for a few weeks and then go and plant it. So we had a yard of Christmas trees in the <laughs> backyard because my father loved trees. He grew up in Manhattan and he, uh. he just, he was crazy about trees coming Coming to Clinton, Connecticut, he, he had a yard. And um, a tree, and, and he could tree. decorate it. So this is about a little Christmas tree, I think that is cut down, by E.E. E. Cummings. Oh, yeah. Little tree, little silent Christmas tree, you are so little, you are more like a flower. Who found you in the green forest? And were you very sorry to come away? See, I will comfort you because you smell so sweetly. I will kiss your cool bark. I will hug you safe and tight, just as your mother would, only don't be afraid. Look, the spangles that sleep all year in the dark box, dreaming of being taken out and allow allowed to shine. The balls, the chains, red and gold, the fluffy threads. Put up your little arms, and I'll give them all to you to hold. Every finger shall have its ring. Mm -hmm. And there won't be a single place dark or unhappy. Then, when you're quite dressed, you'll stand in the window for everyone to see. And how they'll stare. Oh, but you'll be very proud. And my little sister and I will take hands and look up at our beautiful tree and we'll dance and sing. Noel, Noel. Imagine E.E. E. Cummings using that voice. Uh -huh. What a surprise to me, because he's so, in a sense, an adult, um, sophisticated <laughs> poet of the 30s. And here he's addressing, in almost childlike and children's vocabulary, a beautiful thought. Um, you read that as if you're a, a child professional. <laughs> it, I mean, I really felt <laughs> right. the quality of that reading. Thank you. Those kids must have loved you <laughs> and still do. Right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they, when you have a circle time, yeah. uh, you have to be as large as life at least oh, yeah. to, to have, you know, 12 four-year-old eyes yeah, like, and four-year-old bodies not being too busy. Yeah, you know, or too distracted. But drawn right, right there to all the action and the excitement and the... That was a very warm, welcoming voice you used to, to draw them in. Uh, but E.E. E. Cummings strikes me in that one. So, so many poets um, that we normally consider adult poets have come out and, and done children's poetry. Um, there's a book in the library I wasn't able to get a hold of, um, Emily Dickinson's Christmas poem for kids. Hmm. And uh, another poet mentioned it to me, but I didn't have time to grab it. But, oh, I'd love to hear Emily's voice speaking right. to children. Well, maybe next year. I couldn't find it either. I know you mentioned something about oh, it. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Maybe next year. So. That's intriguing to me, to find the uh, everyday, matter-of-fact adult poets changing hats, so to speak, and putting on a child's voice. Beautiful. Um, 
I have a couple of others. One that uh, is both from an adult's point of view, hearkening back to that childhood, you know, and I, I felt the magic this morning. As you said, you woke up and there's snow, but will it keep us from coming? No, right. it didn't. <laughs> it just enhanced everything. Um, a cup of Christmas tea. I was in the library yesterday and Lou Daniels, our librarian in Westbrook, said, oh, Frank, I read this at the Christmas tree lighting. I hadn't heard of it. A cup of Christmas tea. By Tom Hegg. The log was in the fireplace, all spiced and set to burn. At last, the yearly Christmas race was in the clubhouse turn. The cards were in the mail, all the gifts beneath the tree, and 30 days reprieve till Visa could catch up with me. And though smug satisfaction seemed the order of the day, something still was nagging me and would not go away. A week before, I got a letter from my old great aunt. It read, quote, of course, I'll understand completely if you can't, but if you find you have some time, how wonderful if we could have a little chat and share a cup of Christmas tea. She'd had a mild stroke that year, which crippled her left side. Though housebound, now my folks had said it wouldn't hurt her pride. They said, she'd love to see you. What a nice thing it would be for you to go and maybe have a cup of Christmas tea. But boy, I didn't want to go. Oh, what a bitter pill to see an old relation and how far she'd gone downhill. I remembered her as vigorous, as funny, and as bright. I remembered Christmas Eves when she regaled us half the night. I didn't want to risk all that. I didn't want the pain. I didn't need to be depressed. I didn't need the strain. And what about my brother? Why not him? She's his aunt, too. I thought I had it justified. But then, before I knew, the reasons not to go I so painstakingly had built were cracking wide and crumbling in an acid rain of guilt. I put on boots and gloves and cap, shame stinging every pore, and armed with squeegee, sand, and map, I went out my front door. I drove in from the suburbs to the older part of town. The pastels of the newer homes gave way to gray and brown. I had that disembodied feeling as the car pulled up and stopped beside the wooden house that held the Christmas cup. How I got up to her door, I really couldn't tell. I watched her hand rise up. I watched my hand rise up and press the button of the bell. I waited, aided by my nervous rocking to and fro. And just as I was thinking I should turn around and go, I heard the rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall. The clicking of the door latch and the sliding of the bolt and a little swollen struggle popped it open with a jolt. She stood there, pale and tiny looking fragile as an egg. I forced myself from staring at the brace that held her leg and though her thick bifocals seemed to crack and spread her eyes, their milky and refracted depths lit up with young surprise. Come in, come in, she laughed the words and took me by the hand, and all my fears dissolved away as if by her command. We went inside, and then, before I knew how to react, before my eyes and ears and nose was Christmas past alive, intact, the scent of candied oranges, of cinnamon and pine, the antique wooden soldiers in their military line, the porcelain nativity I'd always loved so much, the Dresden and the crystal I'd been told I mustn't touch. <laughs> My spirit fairly 
vaulted like a child out of glass of class and danced among the ornaments of calico and glass like magic i was six again deep in a christmas spell steeped in the million memories the boy inside knew well and here among old christmas cards so lovingly displayed a special place of honor for the ones we kids had made and there beside her rocking chair the center of it all, my great aunt stood and said, how nice it was, I'd come to call. I sat and rattled on about the weather and the flu. She listened very patiently, then smiled and said, what's new? Thoughts and words began to flow. I started making sense. I lost the phony breeziness I use when I get tense. She was still passionately interested in everything I did. She was positive, encouraging, like when I was a kid. Simple generalities still sent her into fits. She demanded the specifics, the particulars, the bits. We talked about the limitations that she'd had to face. She spoke with utter candor and with humor and good grace, then defying the reality of crutch and straightened knee on wings of hospitality she flew to brew the tea. I sat alone with feelings that I hadn't felt in years. I looked around at Christmas through a thick, hot blur of tears. And the candles and the holly she had arranged on every shelf, the impossibly good cookies she still somehow baked herself. But these rich, tactile memories became quite pale and thin. When measured by the Christmas, my great aunt kept deep within. Her body halved and nearly spent, but my great aunt was whole. I saw a Christmas miracle, the triumph of a soul. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall. The rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. She poured two cups, she smiled, and then she handed one to me. And then we settled back and had a cup of Christmas tea. Frank, you read that as everyone in it. You read that as the man and the child that the man remembers and the grandmother, I mean the aunt. Yeah. And that was, that was like its own Christmas story, its own Christmas carol. It is a narrative. Yeah, it's a it wonderful is. wonderful Christmas carol. Yeah. Who knew? I didn't know. I, Good I, old Lou. And who, who, uh, who's the author? The author is Tom Hegg. And I don't know what else he's written, but that's a winner. Yeah, and, and isn't it great when you just, somebody shares something with you that you've never heard before, whether On it's the at fly. the library or, yeah. And then, great. of course, Christmas books for children have to have illustrations. Oh, yeah. Every other page is the most beautiful illustration. I think um, <clears throat> I heard uh, some relatives' voices in my own voice, too. Right, right. <laughs> From time past. Uh, and yet, the six-year-old boy at the window That's great. is uh, entranced by the magic. And what a Christmas miracle a cup of tea is because it's not just the tea that fills the cup, right? right. It's a cup of kindness there. It's the shared pot. It's the, the comes shared the pot. pot. In the olden days when it was a pot of tea and it poured into at least two cups and, and it was the conversation. It was. It wasn't that thing that you press the button and no. it comes out in one serving. It's that elegant it's that whole, yeah. And tea pot, which is so beautiful. Um, I can almost imagine her saying to him as he leaves, well, just hang on to your tea cozy. <laughs> right. She's got the spunk and the spirit, even though she's doubled over. Share a cup of kindness there. It's a beautiful metaphor. Yes. What a fun poem for Christmas kids. 
So, would you like me to read uh, the Sylvia Plath poem next? Or? Yeah, okay. that'd be wonderful. Sylvia Plath is another um, serious, adult, brilliant poet who really has such a genius command of poet's diction that um, she could be actually a little difficult to read. This isn't the one that I thought I had. And Wait capture. Um, Here's the one. She's so wonderful in uh, her imagery, which you'll hear in a minute, and also the, the diction, which is challenging. But she, uh, she has a, a wonderful uh, sense of holding despair at bay even though around the holidays it's, um, it's overwhelming for her. Her life story is uh, very tragic, I feel. Mm, I agree. So this, this poem that you found for me, thank you very much for oh, letting you. me read it. Uh, I, I read it once um, as we were preparing, and uh, I don't have this experience of going to Boston Common as a child. and. Uh, but I do have the experience of my grandmother taking me from Queens into New York City. Ooh. So I do remember the shop windows and that kind of experience. How old were you? Oh, I was uh, maybe just six or seven. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I know because know my sister was a baby. The windows. Yeah. A Winter's Tale. On Boston Common, a red star gleams, wired to the tall Ulmus Americana, Magi near the Dome State House. Old Joseph holds an alpenstock. Two waxen oxen flack, uh, flank the child. A black sheep leads the shepherd's flock. Mary looks mild. Angels, more feminine and juice than models from Bonwits or Jays. Halos, lustrous as serious. Gilt trumpets raise. By S.S. Pierce, by S.S. Pierce, the red-nosed, blue-capped women ring for money. Lord, the crowds are fierce. There's caroling on Winter Street, on Temple Place. Poodles are baking cookies in Filene's show windows. <laughs> Grant us grace, Donner Blitzen, and all you Santas, dear, who browse by leave of the Park Commission on grass that once fed Boston cows. In unison on Pinckney, on Mount Vernon, Chestnut, the wreathed doors open to the crowd. Noel, Noel, no mouth is shut. Off key and loud, the populace sings toward the sill of windows with odd violet panes. O oh, little city on a hill, the cordial strains of bell ringers and singers rouse frostbitten pigeons eddy forth from Charles Street to the Custom House, from South Station to North. Noel, Noel, bell. that was also in the uh, Cummings poem at the end. Yeah, so that's that. the bell. Right, right. Noel, Noel. Thank you, Gemma. That, that is a packed poem. It is. <laughs> and I loved the... Um, the tongue twisters in there. Yeah, and it's which is a few that I stumbled over <laughs> yeah, too. But they are beautiful. Though, though. They're, they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, did one waxen, strike you that you really like? Uh, two waxen oxen flank the child. Say that. Yeah. Two waxen oxen, oxen flank, flank the, the child. child. Yeah. I mean, but it's music. <laughs> it is. But also <laughs> tongue twisters. That's Sylvia. Yeah, so evocative of Christmas. Well, we're going to take a short break. Okay. Um, I, uh, I want to unpack that poem for myself soon to get the imagery because it's so rich. It is. Yeah. Um, so if you're um, watching us and want to take a two-minute break, that would be good. <laughs> There's some great service announcements that come right away. Um, but if you want some glug, that's Swedish for... Go stir it up. Right. Drink a little glug. You might need back. it for our second half. You're going to need it for this second half. Hang on to your tea cozy. 
not glued water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. See you in two. Calls me googly eyes. And you know you're beautiful, right? You know that? Even you are beautiful. I got bullied for wearing glasses. Share if you're against bullying. We put it out there, just took off. Three million people have shared this post. Don't let bullies get you down. I stand with you. My <laughs> whole family's wearing glasses. I wear glasses and I'm proud. I even have the army on my team. All the kind comments brought my child joy. I don't feel thank you is enough. Thanks. I'm Howard Schwartz, spokesman for Better Business Bureau serving Connecticut with the Consumer Moment. The vast majority of businesses are ethical and work hard to keep their customers happy so that they'll return next time. Unfortunately, sometimes things don't work out the way they should. If you have a dispute with a vendor, try to settle it directly. You'll be surprised how effective it can be to discuss rather than argue. Explain that you'd like to turn a problem into a win-win situation that will make you a satisfied customer. If that doesn't work, file a complaint with your Better Business Bureau and we will work to help you settle your dispute. Retailers know the importance of positive recommendations and they also know that consumers won't hesitate to tell their friends, families and colleagues if they are not treated well. This Consumer Moment is brought to you by Better Business Bureau Serving Connecticut. Visit us at bbb.org and start with trust. With newspapers and media outlets merging all over the country, communities are losing their local voice. There's so much going on in the community that I think does, doesn't really, uh, there's a lot of folks who are unaware of it. And I think things like this can bring it out into the community and in, in that way kind of bring the community together. Information and to our residents is the key to good governance. And with the national media and local media not often covering us, this is an excellent opportunity for us constantly to communicate with our constituents and, and also to have them communicate with us. The best outcomes will be achieved through a community-based organization that grows its operation and scale by means of locally produced programming. All of our content is volunteer produced, so we do shows from talk shows to music shows, uh, working with high schools. VSCTV is committed to ensuring that the investment made to secure these powerful tools will pay great dividends in the community for many, many years. Welcome back to Poetry of Immigrants. Glad you're back with us. I realize some of my neighbors say, well, I watched the first half of the program, but then I got distracted. So <laughs> you don't want to miss the second half today. Yeah. Well, I am going to follow with another Sylvia Plath poem that is nature-based. Um, I love her appreciation of nature. She wrote a poem I read last time. Frog autumn, the fen sickens. Oh, she talks in the frog's voice. What brilliance that brings out in the perspective of winter closing in and the lid is getting lower and lower. But before that, we've got the bees. The bees, the frogs, the crows. The arrival of the bee box. She was a beekeeper. I ordered this. This clean wood box square as a chair and almost too heavy to lift. I would say it was the coffin of a midget or a square baby were there not such a din in it. The box is locked. It is dangerous. I have to live with it overnight and I can't keep away from it. There are no windows, so I can't see what is in there. There's only a little grid, no exit. I put my eye to the grid. It is dark, dark, with a swarmy feeling of African hands, minute and shrunk for export, black on black, angrily clambering. How can I let them out? 
It is the noise that appalls me most of all, the unintelligible syllables. It is like a Roman mob, small, taken one by one, but by God, together? I lay my ear to furious Latin. I am not a Caesar. I have simply ordered a box of maniacs. <laughs> they can be sent back. They can die. I need feed them nothing. I am the owner. I wonder how hungry they are. I wonder if they would forget me if I just undid the locks and stood back and turned into a tree. There is the laburnum its blonde colonnades and the petticoats of the cherry. They might ignore me immediately in my moon suit and funeral veil. I am no source of honey, so why should they turn on me? Tomorrow I will be sweet, God. I will set them free. The box is only temporary. 62, so her imagery of death and foreboding and claustrophobia is closing in. Um, such a change of tone, almost like partly a high tone poetic voice reveling in its genius and, and academic brilliance, transitioning after a couple of kids and pregnancies and and probably um, depression, postpartum depression. She's feeling closed in in London in this apartment mm -hmm. and puts her head in an oven and, and leaves her children. I that is dark that and yet is dark. at 33 she was uh, in full flower as a poet. Yeah, she experienced both the sweet honey and the sting. Both. Mm -hmm. And what an image. And why was she so attracted to beekeeping? I'm interested in people who are that way. Right. I don't. It's kind it's of like an ordering of the universe because there's a control, and uh -huh. yet there's the, the letting it go and the freedom of she admires letting the bees out. Right. <laughs> There's and she needs to be let out of her, her casket at this time. Well, that is a poem that begins to contemplate solstice. And I, I have a poem as we contemplate solstice. Um, it is the fifth anniversary of Sandy Hook. Uh. It's not an anniversary we like to celebrate, but unfortunately, since Sandy Hook, we have less and less to celebrate because um, there's still the problem. And right after Sandy Hook, the fingers were pointing back and forth here and there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we had a saying in the 60s, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. We still uh, say it. We still say it. So I wrote this. It, it, I wrote this in a, in a rant. Good. But it's called part of the problem. And it has the punch and power of a rant. The real problem, the statistician on the radio said, is not school shootings. Statistically, he explained, more people people are shot in one-on-one -on -one crimes of passion. The problem is that there is more than one problem. <laughs> the problem is imagining a child could be a statistic. The problem is Hopalong Cassidy, is Rambo, is Kill Bill, is Star Wars, is G.I. Joe, is Transformers, is Lethal Weapon, is Terminator, is Die Hard, is The Dark Knight, is Natural Born Killers. The problem is that television, computers, and video games are not babysitters, and institutions are not mothers and fathers. The problem is the insurance company, which will not embrace the psychotherapist after six visits. <laughs> the problem is 50 shades of normalizing abuse and romanticizing violence. The problem is that the media persists in sensationalizing the actions of a crazy person. The problem is that lockdown only works in jails. <laughs> the problem is Postal 2, Grand Theft Auto, Manhunt, Mad World, Thrill Kill, Mortal Kombat, Gears mm. of War, Gods of War, Soldier of Fortune, Armageddon. The problem 
is that the motive of a crazy person is ultimately irrational. There is no reason to examine and examine. The problem is that the National Rifle Association, its gun lobby, and the members of Congress who take their money. The problem is that children die of starvation, disease, and genocide every day without a list of their names. The problem is that brain function is distorted by toxic chemicals in the food, the water, the air, the womb. The problem is that the Second Amendment is a dangerous, archaic artifact. The problem is that parents are texting and the child is invisible. The problem is that the child and our culture will use a stick or a finger as a gun if nothing else is at hand. The problem is that the psychotherapist doesn't even have time for her own children. The problem is Ronald Reagan, who said after his attempted assassination, which wounded his press secretary, James Brady, it does not change my mind about gun control. The problem is cutting the mental health budget to sponsor another war for Halliburton. The problem is that we apparently forgot to pray for the safety of our children since, as clergymen remind us, God answers all prayers. The problem is that legislation is always one giant step behind technology. The problem is that our society has made bullies into heroes. The problem was that my granddaughter was six. The problem was that since Herod, the innocents have been slaughtered in the name of preserving revenue. The problem is that we, if we are not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. And, it, and if we are a part of the solution, we are only part of the solution to the problem we have identified as the problem. And the six-year-old child. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought her in. Um, so much that a uh, young person has to face today that is so overwhelming that I can't even imagine of it 50 years or uh, 70 years ago right. when I was six. Oh, I know. Oh. Well, we did have duck and cover. I mean, you know. We did have duck and cover. So there were some things that maybe we weren't completely aware of, but... There was intrusion even then. Yes, serious on intrusion. On our childhoods, yeah. On our childhood innocence. Um, breaks my heart when I travel the world um, in the news cycle and in my imagination and also in the fundraisers for children of uh, Palestine and, and Yemen mm -hmm. and uh, I mean the- Congo. Congo last night, mm -hmm. oh, how brutal. And um, I'd like to read a poem from a Palestinian poet. And uh, it's called, um, but I think I'll hold that a little longer um, toward the end. Uh, and I want to do a, a sort of uh, redo of a poem that a young fellow who's a poet in town, um, Jonius is his name, and uh, he wrote Proletariat. He handed it to me as a gift, and I thought, oh, do you mind if I read that someday? He said, no, it would be great if he were able to hear it. We the paupers of the powerless class, whose refined steel girds your glass, weary peasants, who shoulder your mass, an alternate future shall come to pass. We the spirits shouting for thee will open your eyes and set you free. Decadence ablaze to high degree, clear our minds and forever be. We hungry knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, we hungry knights in the final hour raise the city and topple the tower, the cult of self it may devour. With us, for us, denier a lower. How interesting his uh, rhyming is. He's uh, a poet in progress, clearly. And uh, there are folks on the street in Westbrook <laughs> who are tree climbers and uh, work for tree companies cutting down limbs who do this for their own satisfaction. And they love to, to meet a poet who might receive their poetry and enjoy it. Um, 
That harkens back to an earlier time, first half of the show. Um, but I'd like to um, continue with a poem of my own that uh, comes from a time ago, and I don't think it has any 60s echoes. <laughs> But it might. It might. It might. Um, so our next show, number 12, coming up, um, will be a music show. And we're going to hear from the Doors. Great. Yeah. And whoever else. Did you really engage in the 60s or did you miss something? Oh, no. I definitely engaged in the Good. 60s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I was there. I... I my the first concert I went to was the Beatles at Shea Stadium. Wonderful, '63. Yeah, no, '60, '60. Well, what was it? Yeah, I, I I have time chronology all messed up. But then I was in I was going from seventh to eighth grade. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. and then uh, that was a screamer. Yeah, and then the next year uh, was Simon and Garfunkel and Love and Spoonful at the Yale Bowl. Uh huh. So you know. I didn't go to the famous Doors concert. No. And I wasn't in jail with Jim Morrison. No. I didn't happen to be arrested that night, as many people claim, and, you know, <laughs> hang out with James, uh, Jim Morrison in jail. In jail, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I, I engaged with the 60s. You really did. Quite a bit. I missed it, yeah. politically and musically. <laughs> <laughs> well. So maybe these two poems will bring me back there. Yeah. I mean... I think everybody brought their own perspective from it, so. Absolutely, you know, yeah. It wasn't. Could you read my idol poem? Sure. Um, it's kind of a dark. I want to make sure I have them. Picture of childhood. <clears throat> I will. Thank you. Your idol poem. Hope I do it justice. Oh dear, which? That's all right. Is it in this? Is it? I must have turned the... Here we go. Oh, thank you. Idols of Childhood by Francis E. Crowley. One, idol, a tree transformed into a loving God by me. Idol, a tree transfixed by my own limbs through thee. Idol, a three-in-one tree transfigured into thee. Idol, we are transfused in the crossfire by thee. Idol, free of form, I cannot follow what I cannot see. Idol, we cannot adore what we cannot be. Idol, I see only wood where once I found thee. Two, what moves me most is what I dread, that these remain when memory is dead. Thank you. That is my 60s poem. It's a reflection back in late 20s on, on being a child of six and uh, suffering um, through some personal trauma. I was also enamored of rhyme and practicing my craft. That's, that's beautiful. A 60s poem. OK. I'm going to read. Ah, spoken word poem. What was the spoken word revolution? Well, in 1985, Mark Smith, this wonderful barkeep in North Chicago, said, get the damn poem off the page. Perform it. Live it. Oh, boy. Strut. Um, so this is my homage to Mark Smith. Um, I think he's still with us, but for a rhyming purpose, he had to die. <laughs> <laughs> the spoken word revolution. In 1985, Mark Smith was still alive. Take the poem off the page and put it on the stage. Spout them, shout them in the air from your blowhole. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll are dead, gratefully. Must not be read from the page, which I'm doing. <laughs> no prancing poetry, no reading aloud from the scroll. It's the rule. That's the premise. 
Okay. I was in Tucson at a, um, a wonderful poetry slam. They're big on poetry slams in Tucson on Speedway, which has uh, been dubbed the ugliest main street in the country. <laughs> but this place had a monthly poetry slam, and there are three winners. I actually felt cheated. Because <laughs> oh. I thought my poem was good. <laughs> but everybody else won. Somebody else bribed the judge. Somebody bribed the judge. That's what a, a slam's all about. The fun of it. Yeah. Nothing serious, right. really. No longer sterile in this scansion cage, this poem's feral. Released in the wild, two yellow cat's eyes scan the crowd. The Smokey dies alive with grunts, growls, howls, gutturals. No sphinx to kinks the meaning. Just stomping feet greet the gray beast. Start the slam, wham, bam, thank you, man. It's a crowd of hams hoping to win the heat. Hold up your tens. Hearing a new beat to life in performance under the hot lights, the, this huge cat's teeth, breaking jaws, cracking open the line. It's a fight, bombastic, elastic, fantastic, acrostic slip. Dim the lights, how many bad angels can you fit on the head of your dick? Hip hop makes me feel more alive in this dive. The bar doesn't give a crap if it's doggerel, hog hollas, sestina sonnets from angel-headed hipsters or rap. The lineup of poets and pipsters, hip cats and crew, crawls to a close when the audience throws poo. <laughs> I had the time of my life writing this. No longer love, death, loss, romance. Now every line fights for life, it must sing and dance. We've heard inspiration from Blake Whitman's free verse. Emily's university loved, but her line's too terse. At last, show's over. The voting winds up with a three-way tie. I'm not in it. <laughs> we was robbed, shouts the rest, but the best is to be. It's Catman, a first-timer young girl with banana blonde curls, and the man from Morocco facing off in a whirl of bad words. A deathmatch haiku is the final test. The topic, scatology and turds. You can guess the rest. Catman controlled his snarls, self-mythology, rose in robust challenge with cadence, comp compression, and 17-syllable song. Gave the best purring, meowing, litter box rhyming ding-dong, licked his tabby paws in an ecstasy of self-valorization. Went on to the Nationals in the New York in the year. Won the Slam Nation. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true poem. I mean, the three of them were fantastic. I can't imagine that a, Catman. <laughs> that a haiku of scatology, scatological <laughs> poem, poems would. Uh, a death match. <laughs> scatology have, yeah. and turds. I, That's how wild Tucson's. This is for you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> a spoken word revolution is, is still with us. Um, and there's performance poetry going on every night somewhere. Um, you judge the quality. Well, when you said I had a heck of a time writing this, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you're every time you perform it, you're still having a heck of a time. It's right? so entertaining. As, as is the audience. And brings me back to the true voting that night. And I had two friends there for support, and they said, you was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, my poem might have measured up, but I think slams bring out the best in performance because people memorize the stuff. They write their stuff and memorize it and then perform it with uh, as many dramatic flourishes as you can get. Ah, poetry. So what a range. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So 
<laughs> so this, I don't know what, this, what the segue is here, but. It's a good one. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, right? But it's, yeah. all, but it's all good. It's and, all good, uh, yeah. If close, close as I come to spoken word, I'm going to call it talking wet talk. Well, maybe in January. <laughs> talking wet talk. Let's talk about water. Sometimes a trickle, a trickle, a pinprick drip of water. If you are thirsty, not enough. If you are a farmer, empty silos. If you are putting out California wildfires, evacuate. If that guy who controls the dam promises you it will trickle down, <laughs> make another plan. Let's talk about water, sometimes ice, sometimes polar ice caps. If the temperature soars, ice melts, melts. Sometimes this is called a conspiracy and a hoax. But let's call it chemistry and physics. Coal is carbon when it burns carbon dioxide, a heat ceiling. Picture a glass ceiling only forever. Goodbye, Texas Gulf. Goodbye, New Orleans. Goodbye, Florida. Goodbye, Sri Lanka. Goodbye, Cape Cod. Goodbye, Samoa. <laughs> Let's talk about water. 92% of human blood is water. This is true whether you live on this side of that wall or the other, whether you spill someone's casually or donate your own in vials. Used metaphorically, it is nonsense. Blood itself neither entitles nor excludes. We all bleed the same stuff. Let's talk about tears. Water with the sting of salt. In bedrooms and battlefields and jail cells and hospitals, in high schools and playgrounds, when the bully goes unchecked, tears flow, mixed with blood. Let's talk about water with enough wind and havoc Drops in the updraft form balls of ice. Then hail lays waste. As in hail to the chief, then shelter in place. One more thing about water. Mm. The trickle exploits thirst. The wellspring slakes thirst. The wellspring buds a rivulet. The rivulet provokes the brook. The brook sustains the stream. The streams nourish the creek. The creek swells to the river. The river joins hands with purpose to reach the sea. Moving forward together is the strength of water. Ni wikoni, water is life. Bravo, that's the water poem I was looking for. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of fun today, Gemma. Thank you. Uh, celebrating I have too. the Christmas season and also um, some of the dark sides of childhood innocence being abused. Um, and what a world after 50 years. I, I really love the roundness of going back to the 60s and so many themes and coming full circle. Um, I uh, wish I could go back to the 60s and relive it as I am now. That is, you know, a little leather. <laughs> <laughs> I did take the, the required road trip of the Summer of Love, 67, to San Francisco. Oh. But I missed everything. What did I know at 23? I didn't. I just was there, but, right, right. you know, I never yeah. got off the, uh... oh, thank you so much, Gemma. Thank you, Frank. Uh, what a delight to work with you. Um, and I hope you continue to be co-producer with me for. I hope too. For the everlasting future yeah it's great to celebrate the word and uh, travel the world with you too so this is number 11 we'll uh start number 12 in a few minutes okay and uh i sure appreciate uh our doing this together
it's been a wonderful dynamic. It is. It, yeah. <laughs> and everyone is, is different and different and yet the spontaneity is so live. So we'll call it a wrap. Okay. And uh, I'll try a new hat on. <laughs> <laughs>